So next we're going to be talking about dietary and pharmacological ways to try to decrease this chance of stone recurrence. So stones are common. One out of eight people have stones. The chance of recurrence of, of a stone, if you have a stone, is about 50% at five years. So this is really a time where you can capture the patient. They come in in pain. Hopefully they pass the stone or you get it out for them. But now they really want to know, what did I do wrong? How do I prevent my next stone? So for almost everything in stone disease, whether you're looking at calcium, oxalate, uric acid, the heritability is high, over 80%. If you look at calcium oxalate supersaturation, about 84% of it is related to the genes. So that, that question, what did I do wrong? You pick the wrong parents. Go back and pick other parents. You'll do better next time around. But this doesn't mean that you can't change that risk with diet or medications. We reassure them that there are things that they can do. Also pointing out pH uric acid supersaturation, those are the two things that are less likely linked to genes. So more likely you'll be able to modulate the risk factor for someone with those two parameters and decrease their chance significantly of having a recurrent stone. So all patients get these recommendations. And how many of you have heard Michael Moyad talk? I'm sure many of you have. And at the beginning of his, his dietary talks, he always says that whatever we were telling patients for stones, for prostate cancer, the first thing is to make sure it's good for your overall health because cardiac is the main issue. Sorry, David. And if you can increase the risk of something being good while minimizing or decreasing the risk of a cardiovascular event, you're doing a good benefit for the patient. So you'll notice that all these things are relatively healthy. Increase fluids, decrease sodium, increase citrates, and take an adequate amount of calcium. 10 10-ounce glasses a day, one way to tell a patient. Drink enough to make two liters of urine, that's another way. When you look at your urine, can you see through it? Is it pale? A variety of ways to try to get the patient to this level here. Ongoing stern, uh, studies currently looking at smart bottles or apps, different ways to use technology to help improve patient compliance and hopefully have an impact on their stone risk. Sodium restriction, 1,500 milligrams a day. Dietary citrate can be concentrated lemons and limes, four ounces, or we'll talk about some other alternatives. And an adequate amount of calcium, as you know, calcium binds oxalate in the bowel. Restricting calcium increases your risk because you lose that ability to prevent hyperoxaluria. So two to three servings per day, 1,200 milligrams per day. But what's the evidence to support these recommendations? We'll start with fluids. A five-year study, patients are randomized to either treatment or placebo or no treatment. The treatment arm was told, drink enough so you make two liters of urine a day. Market decreases in stone recurrence. And for those 12% of patients who did reform a stone again, their time to recurrence was longer than in, in the group that did not re receive those recommendations. So high level evidence supporting the use of fluids. Fluids can come in many forms. It can come in a glass, it can come in a bottle, but it can also come in the form of ice cream, soup, uh, jellos, a variety of ways so you're not drowning the patient to increase the fluid throughout their diet. Now I pounced on a few people for their drinks. Dark colas are bad, clear colas are good. So if you chose the Sprite, the Sprite Zero, you're in good shape. The more you drink, the less likely you are to form stones. This study, they took people who were drinking a fair amount of, of uh, sodas, 160 cc's a day, and asked them to stop. If they stopped and they were drinking dark colas, because dark colas have phosphoric acid, their risk of stones went down. If they were drinking Sprite, 7-Up, ginger ale, those have citric acid, their risk of stones went up. So if you have a patient who really needs that soda, have them drink a diet soda, and have them drink a soda that's clear as opposed to dark, because you can actually decrease the risk of stones due to the citric acid concentrations. Citric acid is important in a variety of different stages, supersaturation, nucleation, growth, and aggregation of stones, a variety of reasons why increasing dietary citrate is important. Four ounces of concentrated lemon juice was the first way it was studied. Stoller demonstrated that urinary citrates increase with no change in urinary oxalates. Citrates are found in a variety of places. Fresh lemons and limes are the best source. Concentrated lemons and limes are good. Orange juice is good. Lemonade isn't so good because only about 5 to 10 percent of lemonade is actually lemon juice. Now, sometimes patients say, make it easy for me. Can you give me an easy diet? I don't want to worry about four ounces or three ounces. The easy thing is eat lots of fruits and vegetables. 
If you add fruits and vegetables to the diet of a stone former, you increase potassium, magnesium, citrate, calcium, and can decrease the calcium oxalate supersaturation by 52%. In contrast, if one takes normal people, not stone formers, and asks them to eliminate those foods, their risk of stones increases dramatically. So fruits and vegetables is the easy answer you'll find not only for citrates, but a few other things in the talk as we go on. Now, all citrate is not the same. Citric acid in the diet comes in two forms, citric acid and potassium citrate. Citric acid is rich in lemons and limes, whereas melons and tomatoes are rich in potassium citrate. So the era of personalized medicine doesn't just apply to prostate cancer. It applies to dietary recommendations for stones. If you have a patient where the goal is to raise citrate, but their pH is already high, say they have RTA, or distal renal tubular arch acidosis, their pH is already six or seven, but their citrate is low. For those patients, it personalize their approach, recommend lemons and limes, but perhaps don't recommend these. In contrast, if you have a more common patient, a patient with a low pH and low citrate, maybe a calcium oxalate storm former or uric acid storm former, those would be patients where you would focus on the melons, tomatoes, and oranges have about a balanced amount of citric acid and potassium citrate. Don't limit the calcium. Limiting calcium increases the risk of symptomatic stones by causing an increase in the risk of hyperoxaluria. This just shows that the less dietary calcium you take in, the higher your chance of stones compared to those who take in more calcium. One of the controversies is calcium supplements, and unfortunately, calcium supplements do slightly increase the risk. Now, it's difficult to know whether it's the supplement or the timing that you're taking it. So one of the things with our dietary counseling we do is if patients can't give up their strawberries, we tell them put some cream on it. If you can't give up your broccoli or spinach, put some cheese on it. Trying to balance the calcium and the oxalate intake to promote the binding in the bowel is important, and perhaps you're losing that if you're just taking a calcium supplement in the morning. So dietary calcium can come in a variety of forms, but you see that you really need about three to four servings a day to be able to reach this 1,200 milligram uh, target for the day. Dietary sodium restriction is important because one teaspoon of salt will increase urinary calcium 23 milligrams, leads to higher rates of bone resorption, and has a greater effect if you have a low dietary calcium intake. We eat about twice as much sodium as is recommended, over 3,000 milligrams a day of sodium, increasing not only the risk of stones, but that important thing, cardiovascular disease. Does limiting sodium impact stone disease? And the answer is yes. First, looking at those who limited their sodium, what happened to their urinary sodium? It went down significantly compared to controls. Does that make a change in the urinary calcium? Again, the answer is yes. Limiting your sodium decreases the urinary calcium significantly. Indeed, 62% of patients could normalize their urinary calcium just by limiting their, their sodium. So the first line therapy for hypercalciuria is sodium restriction. What's the first line therapy for someone with hypercalciuria? Sodium restriction, very good. If that doesn't work, the second line therapy is fish oil. Fish oil decreases PGE2, decreases renal calcium excretion, and improves renal reabsorption, decreases the risk of bone resorption. It can be found in a variety of foods, salmon, tuna, mackerel, a variety of uh, nuts and, and oils, but it's more commonly used in the U.S. and elsewhere uh, as a supplement. 1,800 milligrams of EPA, the active ingredient, decreases urinary calcium and improves urinary citrate. The third line therapy is thiazides. We use thiazides if dietary sodium restriction and fish oil isn't adequate. We repeat the 24-hour urine three months after they've done those two things. At that point, we'll introduce a thiazide, acts on the distal tubule, increases calcium reabsorption, increases bone mineral density. This would be just one of many studies showing three, year, three years follow-up decrease in urinary calcium, and improvement in stone-free rates. The AOA guidelines for medical therapy came out two years ago. We did an ARC study prior to that to develop the database that was used to develop the guidelines. So we looked only at studies that had a clinical outcome of stone recurrence, either radiographic or symptomatic. You can see the number of studies are few, the number of patients are small, 
but a marked decrease, about 50%, in the risk of stones by giving thiazides to people who have recurrent calcium stones. Now, these aren't select patients. These aren't patients with high urinary calcium. These are all comers. None of these RCTs selected patients specifically based on their urinary calcium level. Another issue is the bone health. Bones and stones are related. Minnesota study demonstrated that the risk of vertebral fractures was higher than in stone formers than you would expect. Well, you say that's okay, just give them calcium and vitamin D. You already told us that taking calcium is good. Well, unfortunately, calcium and vitamin D, the common approach to patients with bone disease, isn't effective, though these lines look different. The risk of hip fracture was the same statistically in those who received placebo compared to those who received calcium and vitamin D. So the approaches that we're using to treat bone disease are not effective, but they are effective at increasing the risk of stones. So what can we use to improve bone health but also decrease the risk of stones? We start with potassium citrate. Potassium citrate improves the bone density in the microarchitecture in the lumbar spine, differences in bone mineral density at two years, and at the femoral neck. What if you add a thiazide? Thiazides and potassium citrate in combination improved uh, bone mineral density in the lumbar area, in the femoral neck, and in the radial shaft. Three and a half year follow-up. Marked improvements in urinary calcium and a marked decrease in stone formation. So treat the bones and treat the stones with thiazides and citrates. These are the variety of medications that are used, insufficient data to say which works best. Note that hydrochlorothiazide is a BID dosing to achieve the improvements in stone and bone health. And it's important to replenish the potassium, and it's best to use a citrate supplementation. That, that way you're recruiting both with the thiazide and the potassium citrate. Beyond that use, citrate has other important roles. Alkaline therapy, increasing the pH, decreases the supersaturation for calcium oxalate and calcium phosphate. Stone free rates higher at three years, and potassium supplements are better than sodium-based supplements. We've talked already about increased sodium, increased hypercalciuria, increasing the risk of stones, which explains why a sodium-based supplement is not as effective as a potassium-based supplement. Preminger's three-year data demonstrating marked decreases in stone formation. Our ARC study, fewer studies, fewer patients, a wider range in terms of effect, but still in effect. Again, unselected patients, not based on low citrate, all were current stone formers treated empirically, which raises the question, should we be doing 24-hour urine collections? Is that important to guide therapy, or should everyone be getting a thiazide and a citrate that's an area of controversy currently. We don't really have good evidence to support the use for 24-hour urine collections. Where I find 24-hour urine collections helpful, first is to stratify therapy. Half the patients will respond to diet alone, so half of them won't need medications. And to improve compliance in terms of encouraging patients things are improving, continue to do what you're doing, maybe do some fine tweaking to decrease your risk further. So what if the 24-hour urine shows a hyperoxaluria? This is probably the hardest. These are foods that people enjoy. These are foods that are otherwise healthy. So getting back to making recommendations that are good for your overall health. If it's a diabetic, they need their nuts for protein. If they're obese, maybe this is a good diet for them. Overall, this is a healthy food to follow. And we don't recommend limiting oxalates unless the urinary oxalate is high. Only about 30% of stone formers are gonna have hyperoxaluria. The remainder of those stone formers can avoid limiting their oxalate. The two foods to focus on are spinach and rhubarb. We see that the amount of oxalate in those two foods are markedly higher than anything else. University of Wisconsin has looked at where does the oxalate come from in our Western diet? Spinach, nuts and seeds, and potatoes account for almost half of the dietary oxalate. Tea, fruits, other leafy green vegetables account for less than 10%. So if people say, I like iced tea, I say, drink more of it. The more fluid you drink, the better. The amount of oxalate that you can get out of tea is so low, maybe add some milk to your tea. That way you're balancing the, the, the calcium and the oxalate and decreasing your risk even further of hyperoxaluria. A nice little study to support that is this one, looking at chocolate. 
Who likes chocolate? Good. So if you like chocolate, milk chocolate. The milk binds the oxalate, decreases the amount of hyperoxaluria you see compared to dark chocolate, which obviously doesn't have the calcium to offset the oxalate absorption. So the first approach to hyperoxaluria is diet, limiting oxalate appropriately, but also making sure they're taking an adequate amount of calcium. It may be that they're just not taking enough calcium, and by taking more calcium, they'll be able to prevent oxalate absorption. Second line therapy in this situation is vitamin B6. Vitamin B6 changes the conversion of glyoxalate to glycine, so you're forming less oxalate in your metabolism. It's been shown to be that if you increase your vitamin B6, you can decrease your stone risk, and people who form stones and have hyperoxaluria typically have a B6 deficient diet. Fruits and vegetables, we come back to that theme. Many fruits and vegetables are rich in vitamin B6. If a patient has hyperoxaluria, I'll usually start with a supplement, 50 milligrams a day, and gradually titrate up. At this level here, we start to ask patients about numbness or tingling. Peripheral neuropathy can be one of the side effects of higher doses of vitamin B6. Small number of patients, one year follow-up, 72% of our patients responded to vitamin B6 with lower oxalate levels and decreases in calcium oxalate supersaturation. Lastly, uric acid stones. When do you suspect it? Radiolucin on KUB, Hounsky units low, low urine pH. About 60% of patients with stones and have gout will be calcium, uh, sorry, uric acid stones. 40% of patients with gout will have a calcium-based stone, so don't assume it's a uric acid stone just because the patient has gout. Here the goal is to not only prevent the stones, but also perhaps dissolve them. Uric acid, just like oxalate, comes from the diet as well as from your body's metabolism. If you are on a high-protein diet, Atkins diet or something similar to that, one increases the risk of stones not only because of more uric acid, but also more urinary calcium, lower citrates, lower pHs, increased bone resorption, all these things predisposing you to more stones. But the goal is not to decrease or eliminate your, your protein completely, but just to moderate the amount. Our dietitians will either tell patients to think about a pack of cards or look at the palm of their hands. And so for each protein serving, the size of the protein, whether it's fish, steak, poultry, they're all the same. It's more portion size as opposed to what to eat or what not to eat. More important though than the protein is the pH. Because of the solubility of, of uric acid, that's why it's effective to prevent and dissolve stones with alkalinization. Best depicted here, this dotted line would be the supersaturation for uric acid. We see here that if your pH is five, even one bite of that steak and you're starting to form a stone. Even a small amount of dietary uric acid intake will lead to supersaturation and stone formation with a pH of five. In contrast, if you take your potassium citrate before you eat that sirloin or, or poultry, it doesn't matter how big your portion size is, you'll stay below that supersaturation rate. So if you were to ask which is more important, protein moderation or alkalinization, the answer would be alkalinization. This is especially important today as we get bigger. As the weight goes up, the pH goes down. So one of the risk factors for stones in the obese patient is a lower pH because of problems with ammoniogenesis. As you would expect then, in, stone, in obese patients, 63% of them will have uric acid stones compared to perhaps 20% in the general population. It's important if you look at, at the way they presented what's changing in the 24-hour urine, more common to see stones in, in women, more common to see stones in, as people get older, and more common to see stones in the obese patient. Hypocitraturia increasing, especially in the obese patient, and hyperoxaluria increasing, especially in men. Other things presented at the AOA this year in terms of obesity or the metabolic syndrome or both, the more severe your metabolic syndrome, the more number of traits that you have, the more severe your disease is, the more chances you're gonna have recurrent stones and the more chances you're gonna have multiple stones. Dr. Simos demonstrated that if you have a high BMI, you also have a higher risk of hyperoxaluria. 
and that risk of hyperoxaluria correlates with your hemoglobin A1C. So lose weight, keep your diabetes under control, many risk factors associated with stones, whether it be low pH, high calcium, or high oxalate, that are going to increase the risk of stones in those with those syndromes. Lastly, we come to allopurinol, or fibroxostat, the two exanthine oxidase inhibitors that prevent the conversion of exanthine to uric acid. This, this would be the last tier, so we, we rarely use these medications. We usually rely on diet and alkalinization alone. We'll start at 100 milligrams and titrate up to 300 milligrams. This would be the patient who has persistent hyperuricosuria or elevated uric acid supersaturations on 24-hour urines after alkalinization and dietary measures. Now, it's important that the guidelines don't talk much about uric acid stones because we don't have data. There's no RCTs looking at uric acid stones for allopurinol or alkalinization, specifically as it relates to stone recurrence. You might ask how effective are these therapies I alluded to earlier. Half the time, the abnormalities will normalize just with diet alone. So as an advanced practice provider, this is really a unique thing to do, to set up a stone prevention clinic. I'd encourage all of you to think about that. Dietitians can't bill for stone disease. Advanced practice providers can. They can really facilitate the, the flow of your stone patient, focusing on prevention using diet and medications. For the half of the patients who don't respond to diet alone, how do they do with medications? About 70 to 80 percent response at one year to either a thiazide, a citrate, or a xanthine oxidase inhibitor. So this is a recent data with the urological diseases in America from uh, Matlaga. I really only want to point out that if this is all the medicine that we're giving, this is all opioids. So the opioid epidemic is severe in stone disease. These are younger patients, sorry, this is older patients, Medicare, this is private insurers. We're doing a worse job in the young patients, the one who could benefit most from prevention. Almost the only medicines we're giving them are opioids. We need to do more on the preventive side. Why do we need to do more? Because one thing is it's difficult. Compliance overall is good with thiazides and allopurinol, but citrates, maybe the cost, maybe the side effects, for some reason we need better citrates to be able to be compliant. It's been shown that men, those in the Midwest, salaried, those who are on multiple drugs, used to taking chronic drugs, are more likely to be compliant with stone prevention. But stone prevention is important for overall population health. If you're compliant, 30% chance of admissions for stone, decrease in admissions, 25% decrease in ED visits, and 13% decrease in surgeries for stone disease with appropriate compliance with preventive measures. Lastly, we talked about diet, we talked about medicines. Exercise is perhaps the missing link. The NHANES data asks, have you ever had a stone? 8% of people say yes. The relative risk of having a stone is lower if you exercise for 10 minutes a day, it's lower if you exercise vigorously for 10 minutes a day, and it's lower if you walk or bicycle to school or work. It's higher if you work in a vigorous intensity activity. So if one thinks about this, this might be the worker outside, a construction worker swinging a hammer. Maybe they don't have time to, re to rehydrate. Maybe their work conditions are predisposing them, or maybe it's the act type of activity. These are activities that impact bone health. Walking, running, if you, if you look at astronaut studies and their risk for stones, you can decrease the risk of stones in astronauts if you put them on a treadmill, but you also simulate gravity by using a, a vacuum suction. You, don't do it, you can't do it in microgravity where they don't have that force on the limbs and the spine to maintain bone health. So it may be that this vigorous intensity activity is more upper body and has less impact on bone health, and that's why they have a higher risk of stones. So lastly, you'll point out one study where compliance also relates to the 24-hour urine test. It's hard to do. Patients don't want to carry around a jug for a whole day. They'll typically do this on a Sunday when they're at home. It may not be reflective of their overall risk because their diet on a Sunday may not be the same as Monday through Friday. So we asked the question, could you simplify it? Instead of collecting for 24 hours, what about just collecting it from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m.? In doing so, maybe it'll be a better predictor of stone risk. We know that urine is more concentrated at night than in the day, so maybe we would un unveil 
more abnormalities than we currently see, but more importantly, improve patient compliance, decrease the burden on the patient, and decrease the dependency on weekend collections. So we tried to correlate a 12-hour versus 24-hour urine, and you see that essentially all the parameters we look at correlate very well. Supersaturations correlate tightly. We're able to detect almost all the patients who had an abnormality, but more importantly, identified additional ones who were missed by doing a 24-hour urine collection. We're able to identify all the parameters. All the patients had hyperoxaluria, hypocitrateuria, in, in addition to some patients who were missed. So in summary, a 12-hour nighttime 24-hour uh, urine may be better, better patient compliance, better ability to detect our abnormalities, and direct the best approach to stone prevention. Yeah. So the, the first step in a patient with hyperoxaluria, and recall this is the first step, vitamin B6, calcium carbonate, milk and cheese, eliminate tea, or potassium citrate. So yeah, milk and cheese, absolutely. That's the number one thing is to make sure they're taking an adequate amount of calcium. This would be tertiary approach. If you're gonna use calcium, it's better to use calcium citrate. It's a, it's a more effective calcium supplement in stone formers because you're getting the citrate as opposed to the carbonate. Eliminating tea, we talked about how the amount of oxalate you get in tea is, is minimal, and then potassium citrate wouldn't necessarily have a specific role for hyperoxaluria. The last question is, the first step in patients with hypercalciuria, sodium restriction, decreased calcium intake, hydrochlorothiazide, or so, sodium cellulose phosphate. Good, sodium restriction. We really never recommend calcium uh, restric restriction at this point. Hydrochlorothiazide would be second line. Sodium cellulose used to be used for absorptive issues to decrease absorption of calcium, but then you also decreased absorption of magnesium and other good things, so this is no longer available either.